How you guys doing? Well, you can do better than that. We're in a marriage series. Come on. So I, I feel like because we're in a marriage series, I owe you a public service announcement here. Valentine's Day, guys, this week. If you forgot about it, you're, you're really starting on a bad start for our, our marriage sermon series. So let's get started. Um, when my kids were young, we went on a beach vacation down to the Caribbean, and we got to the hotel late one evening, and the next morning we're, we're excited to head to the beach, and we head out to go to the beach. The problem was you have to go by the hotel pool to get to the beach, and there was nothing special about this pool. There were no water slides. There were no lazy rivers. It was just a little rectangular pool with some old beach chairs and umbrellas. But the kids were really excited to find water, and so they wanted to get in the pool as we went by. And I made this really naive parenting decision to go, you know what, we'll just let them get in for just a second, and they'll get right back out. So they get in the pool, and, and you guys know what happened. They, they didn't want to get out of the water. They wanted to, to play in the pool. And so I tried to explain, guys, we have a pool back in Katy. We don't have this big, beautiful ocean with this amazing beach they weren't buying it. It took us a while. We, we finally got them to get out of the water. And when they did, they were fussing and arguing and unhappy until we got to the beach. Once they got to the beach, the little ones were jumping waves and playing in the sand. The big ones were boogie boarding, and they had a great time. They forgot all about the pool because they remembered how amazing the ocean is. And the next morning when we headed out to the beach, they went, ran right by that pool and went straight to the ocean. They were settling for the pool because they forgot how amazing the ocean is. And I think some of us do that in our marriages too. We kind of settle for the pool. We, we settle for kind of where we are. And so it becomes okay, but not spectacular. It becomes more of a, a business partnership where things are okay, or it's an amicable friendship. And we kind of settle for the pool or things being okay, rather than this big, beautiful ocean that God intended for our marriages. And I think we settle because we've forgotten what it's supposed to be. And some of you guys are here going, man, Nathan, I wish my marriage were a pool. It feels more like, I mean, we're swimming in the toilet. I'd, I'd take a pool even if it was like old and reeked of chlorine and you couldn't see the drain because of the, the cloudiness and there was an old broken chair that threw you off the side. I'd take that because it feels like we're swimming in the toilet. And it feels like you fight all the time. Or maybe you've got to the point where you don't even really talk that much anymore. And it feels like you're living alone even when your spouse is home. And, and so you've gotten to this place where you're ready to take your towel and leave. You, you don't know what to do at this point, but you know you can't keep living like this. And, and God has something so much better in store for our marriages if we'll let him than what we're living in. Here's the good news. And we talked about this a lot last week. God loves you. God loves your marriage, and so he is passionate about your marriages, not just becoming okay, not just becoming a pool, but being this big, beautiful ocean that brings glory and honor to him and brings joy to you. That is his passion for your marriage because it's a beautiful illustration of his relationship with us. Now, here's the problem. We've got Satan on the other side that is trying to tear your marriage down. Satan wants to destroy and tear down anything that God loves. And God loves you, and he loves your marriage. And Satan's really smart. He doesn't usually attack marriage head on. He kind of chips away at it little bit by little bit to where slowly over time he erodes the joy and the happiness. Listen to how pastor and author Max Lakeda says this about how Satan tries to attack our marriages. Satan won't suddenly steal your home from you. He'll do something far worse. He'll paint it with a familiar coat of drabness. He'll replace the evening gowns with bathrobes and the nights on the town with evenings in the recliner. And he'll substitute romance with routine. He'll scatter the dust of yesterday over all the wedding pictures in the hallway until they become just a distant memory of another couple in another time. And usually that's the way Satan attacks our marriage. He's really smart. And so he attacks our marriage one argument by argument. One missed opportunity by the next missed opportunity. One disagreement after another. And slowly over time, we begin to wonder why we got married in the first place. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Ephesians chapter 5. We're looking at this passage of Scripture. We're in the second week of our marriage series called Save the Date, where we're talking about what the Bible has to say about improving our marriages. One of the things I love about the Bible 
is that there's amazing truth and wisdom for living. So even if you're still checking out this whole church thing and you haven't decided what you think about Jesus dying on the cross and rising on the third day, and you're here because you want to make your marriage better, even if you don't believe the ultimate truth of the Bible yet, there's good truth in there to make your marriage better if you'll allow it to. But whether you believe in Satan or not, I do. And I believe that Satan is actively trying to destroy your life. He is actively trying to destroy your marriage. And he does it in a lot of different ways. And it's always generally this back attack that that just doesn't hit us head on so we don't really see it coming. And one of the ways he attacks our marriages is in the differences between men and women. We are different. I know it's not going to surprise you when I say that men and women are different, right? Who's surprised by that? Who went, wow, I didn't know that. We think different. We prioritize different. We even approach situations in different ways. Let me give you some examples. Women like to shop. Men don't. Women like to talk about everything. Men don't. Women can find things in the closet. Men can't. Women go to the bathrooms in groups. Men don't. Even the way we tell if clothes are dirty is different. Women by sight, men by smell. When we drive, women break for small animals. Men usually don't. Men usually break for flat tires. Women often don't. God made men and women differently for different purposes. And if we understand God's plan and we understand those differences, we can use that to bring joy to one another through those differences. But if we don't understand it and we don't appreciate it, it can bring frustration because we don't understand where the other one is coming from. Author John Gray captured this idea in his famous book back in the 90s called Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Who's heard of that book? Yeah, it was a really famous book. It was actually the most popular work of nonfiction in the entire decade of the 1990s. And, and so he comes up with this, we'll call it an original premise, we'll see it's not, but this idea that men and women are different, that there are fundamental psychological differences between us, and so we need different things. And then he jokes that the problem in relating to one another is that we come from different planets, that men come with, from one planet with its own customs and culture, women come from a different planet with different cu- culture and customs, and our problem becomes is we don't really understand the culture and customs of the other planet. So this book sold 50 million copies. It was on this bestseller list for 121 weeks. CNN called it the highest ranking work of nonfiction during the 1990s. But what we're going to see is this original idea by John Gray in this book is not original at all. This passage in Ephesians talked about the exact same thing 2,000 years before. So Ephesians 5, 21 through 33 that we're going to be looking at today is a passage of Scripture that it just candidly has become a little controversial in modern culture because it, it's this idea of submission. And boy, that just doesn't feel right to us sometimes. I was counseling with a young couple. It's been a couple years ago. And they were you know, talking about some issues that they were having. And I pulled out this passage of Ephesians 5 and and the, the wife told me that, you know, it didn't offend her, but it made her a little uncomfortable because it just didn't feel right in a modern relationship, this idea of submission. But as we began to talk about what Paul was saying here, about the differences between submission between men and women, I, I watched them start to look at one another and smile over and over. And then eventually they told me that the reality was that, that most of their fights involved him not showing love to her the way she wanted and her not showing respect to him the way he wanted. And they began to see that this passage of Scripture from 2,000 years ago still understands men and women even today. And so that I'm hopeful that if we really dive into this passage of Scripture and we understand what God is saying to us, it can turn our marriages back into this big, beautiful ocean of passion and joy that God intended. All right, well, leading up to this passage of Scripture, Paul's been writing about how Christians should relate to one another in the context of church and and community, and then he shifts gears, and he begins to talk about how a Christian husband and wife should relate to one another in the context of marriage. Let's look at this together, starting in verse 21 of Ephesians 5. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourself to your husbands as you do the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. 
Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of the body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So we have this passage of Scripture from the Apostle Paul talking about what it looks like to live in Christian marriage. So often we're told by the world that romantic relationships are all about us. How can my spouse make me feel needed and wanted and sexy and confident? But this passage from Ephesians tells us that a marriage relationship to be healthy and thriving starts with mutual submission, where each partner puts his own interests behind the interests of their spouse. And through this idea and this beauty of mutual submission, then love and joy and contentment can flourish. All right, look back at verse 21. We want to break this down a little bit and kind of see what Paul is telling us here. This first verse, 21, is so important to understanding the rest of this section of Scripture. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Understand here, it's not saying submit to one another because of what your spouse has done. It's saying submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The word reverence here, the original Greek word that was used was a word called phobos. And phobos actually translates into also phobia. That's where our English word comes from. So it's this sense of fear. And some of the old English translations still use the word fear instead of reverence here, like the King James Version would still say, out of fear for the Lord. But it's not fear like sharks or like scary clowns. It's, it's this adoration and awe. And so what, it, what Paul is saying is that we submit to our spouse because we have this incredible adoration for God. So here's what that looks like. Ladies, if you're saying, you know, I'm going to submit to my husband and I'm going to start respecting him better when he, you know, puts the toilet down and he starts being a jerk, I'll do that. Missing the point. You don't submit to your husband because he has earned it or because he deserves it. You do it because you have love and respect for Jesus. Guys, when you say, you know, I'll start loving her the way it says to when she quits nagging me around and she starts cooking more like my mama, I'll, I'll love her differently. You're missing the point. The point here is because you love Jesus, you submit to your spouse. You're the first one to do that. So remember, Jesus set the example for us. No one had the right to be served more than Jesus. But he humbly submitted himself to us long before we even knew who he was. He lived a life of ministry to the sick and the dying and the hurting. And then ultimately, he submitted himself to die on a cross for your sins long before you deserved it, long before you recognized who he was. That's the example. And and so, guys, if you don't start by saying, I'm going to be the first one to submit because I love Jesus. Ladies, if you don't become the first one to say, I'm going to submit because I love Jesus, this passage of Scripture isn't going to work for you. You cannot submit because of what your spouse has done. You submit because of what Jesus has done. But here's the thing. If you begin to submit to your spouse the way this passage calls you to, over time you're going to be really surprised at the response you get from your spouse and how they begin to treat you more the way you hope to be treated when you first said, I do. So Paul starts out with this idea of mutual submission, that we submit to one another. But then he's going to give us different instructions about what that looks like. Because just like John Gray said, and men are from Mars, women are from Venus, the Bible recognizes we are different. We are designed differently, and we need different things. And so submission looks a little different. Look at verse 33. However, each one of you must also love his wife. So there's the instruction to the men, as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Both mutual submission, but it looks a little different. It's two sides of the same coin. 
And it's this recognition that we need different things. And the reality is this. Love is more important. The showing of love and romance is more important generally to women than it is to men. And respect is generally more important to men than it is to women. Think about this for a second. The Hallmark Channel, as I understand it, is built completely on like 5 billion women. And as I understand it, my associate pastor, Chris Halbach. I think that's the, what, the people that watch the Hallmark Channel. Guys, we want movies about honor and glory and battle. Now, there are exceptions, but that's generally the case. And ladies, because love is important to you, you're better at showing love than we are. And, and so Paul is saying, guys, love your wives. It's important to her. You don't understand it. Think about this. Can you imagine two dudes out fishing in a boat, and one of them looks up and goes, Bob, I just want you to know I, I love you. You're kind of the wings beneath, wind beneath my wings there, buddy. That's not going to happen. Two dudes are not going to do that. And if they do, Bob's bailing out of the boat and swimming back to shore. We don't understand love as well. And so Paul's saying, guys, love your wives. Love comes easy for women. Ladies, respecting your husband may come a little more difficult because it's not as important to you as love is. All right, so I'm going to take a little time to talk both first to the men and then to the women about how do we do this? How do we show this mutual submission through love and respect? So guys, how do you submit to your wife through love knowing that she's different from you and she needs some different things than you do? The answer is found in verses 25 through 28. Look at this together. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. There it is. Love your wife like Jesus loves us. Man, is that not a tough standard that's set for guys? It is a perfect standard to love with this agape Jesus love, this perfect love of God to love our wives. We're going to fall short, and there's forgiveness when we do, but that's the standard. That's the goal that we're shooting for. And so I want to give you some practical ways that you can show love to your wife. First, have a conversation conversation is so often more important to her than it is to you. Josh McDowell says the chief dysfunction in a failing marriage usually isn't sexual, it's verbal. Regularly have conversation with your wife. And conversation is more than what? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, that's great. That, that's not conversation. If you turn off the computer, turn off the iPad, turn off your phone, whatever it is, and, and look her in the eye and have conversation. I know sometimes face-to-face -face communication for guys can feel kind of aggressive, but for her, it's intimacy. It's showing that you care about what she's saying. And I know you think you can turn in your fantasy football lineman up at the same time you have conversation with your wife, but you don't do it nearly as well as you think you do. Turn off other stuff. Focus on her because that communicates importance to her. Another way to have good communication with your wife is focus less on the problem and more on the emotion. You've probably heard people say, your wife so often doesn't need you to fix her problems. She just wants you to empathize with her. That is absolutely true. So often as guys, we fix things. That's what we do. I mean, most guys, I don't really fix anything because I don't know how. But most guys fix stuff. And so we want to get this detail of explain exactly what they said. Then what, and what she wants is just to empathize. She wants to know that we have her back. And so sometimes we need to just recognize that she needs our support, she doesn't need us to fix a problem. The second way that we can show love to our wives is to serve her. Look back at verse 25. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And then it says, and gave himself up for her. The way Jesus showed humble love was through service. He gave himself up for the church. And that's what we're called to do for our wives, to give ourselves up for her in humble service. Listen to how Jesus says his role about serving was, this is Mark 10, 45. He says, for even the Son of Man, Jesus would often call himself the Son of Man, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what it looks like to love her like Jesus loves us. Serve her. 
make her life easier, make her day better. Let me give you some examples. Wash the kids, wash the dogs, wash the dishes, wash the windows. You see where I'm headed with this. Make her life better. Serve her by doing things she wants to do. So often I think we expect our wives to kind of enjoy in on our activity if she wants to be with us, right? If she wants to be with me, she can, she can clean them fish I caught this morning and she can come watch the game. But that's not how Jesus served us. I, I love how Pastor Gene Apple says it. He says, when Jesus wanted to reach out to us, what did he do? He came into our world and met us where we are. That's why he was called Emmanuel, God with us. So that's the example of what it looks like. We need to step out of our world of video games and work and golf outings, and we need to do things that she wants to do. Meet her where she is. Find common ground with her. Spend time with her doing things she enjoys. Here's another practical tip for showing love. Show her affection, that's only half, with no expectation. Guys, so often when we offer a back rub, we know what we're doing. Guilty, been there. They're smarter than we are. They know what our intentions are. They understand what we're thinking. And we need to show affection with no expectation of anything in return. Just love her. Be affectionate with her solely for the sake of doing that. So if you're watching TV, put your arm around her. If you're driving in the car, I'll so often just reach out and hold my wife's hand while we're driving. If you pass her in the hallway of the house, give her a kiss or a hug with no expectation of anything in return. You're just showing intimacy and romance and love. But guys, here's the thing. If you start doing that regularly, you might just see your bedroom become the big old beautiful ocean that you're hoping it would be. Also, take time to compliment her. Your wife wants to feel beautiful and needed and successful. And so find things to compliment her on. Don't be general. Don't just, you know, oh, you're beautiful. Find specific things. Man, your hair looks different today. I saw what you did with the kids. That was amazing. You're doing great at work. Man, I'm so impressed. Find specific things to compliment her on and then compliment her. Make her feel beautiful and needed and wanted and successful. And don't compliment her only when you want to be intimate with her. Compliment her, again, with no expectation of anything in return. Guys, there's so many things you can do to improve your marriage. Spend time with her. Communicate with her, serve her, be a good father, romance her. This is Valentine's week. <laughs> Think about that. You don't have to spend $500 on flowers. You will amaze your wife if you write her a card that you made yourself. You ask your wives later if they would be impressed if you sat down and really thought through what you love about your wife and made her a card that looked broken and busted and all cut up wrong. They would love that, and it wouldn't cost you anything. Guys, you know how to romance your wives. You somehow tricked her into falling in love with you, and then you confused her and got her to marry you. You did something right at some point in time. Go back and do those things again. Love your wife. All right, ladies, it's your turn. And all the guys said, amen. Look back at verse 33. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. This idea of respect for husbands and fathers is dead in our society. Let's be honest. Have, if you've ever watched a TV show, the husband and father is either an idiot, he is goofy, or he's not even there. And I believe that is Satan tearing down our marriages through the use of media by tearing away this idea of respect for husbands and fathers. Don't respect your husband when he's earned it. Respect your husband because you love the Lord. Respect your husband and then pray for him to become the man God wants him to be and the man that you're desperate for him to be. And watch over time as you begin to encourage him and pray for him that he doesn't become more of the man that you prayed he would be. So here's some practical tips to show respect to your husband. First of all, value his contribution. We talked about how that this idea of this value is important to guys, that the recognition for being a hero. So value his honesty his bravery, value his, his loyalty, his strength, his intelligence. Maybe don't write him a love note. Maybe instead write him a respect note and tell him all the things that he does to make your family go, to make your marriage go. 
and how important he is. Also make sure that when you talk to other people, you're paying him that same respect. When you're talking with your girlfriends, make sure that you are talking about him in ways that support and encourage him. Don't make fun of his failures. Don't talk bad about him behind his back. Be his biggest supporter and go after somebody else that talks bad about your husband. That's your job. Be his biggest defender. The more you encourage what he does well, the more you're going to see him do things well trying to earn your approval and your encouragement. Pastor Mark Merrill gave us a list of 10 things that husbands really need to hear from their wives. It's a pretty good list, so I'm going to give it to you. I love being your wife. You're an amazing father. I'm really attracted to you. I really respect the decision you made. This next one's a tough one. I love how you encourage us to live within our means. I'm grateful for your spiritual leadership. You are so wise. I appreciate how hard you work to support our family. Thank you so much for helping me with that. And finally, I'm really impressed with how you handled that situation. These are some of the best things you can say to your husband. Make sure you're respecting your husband by the way you talk to him and the way you talk about him. The worst thing you can do, ladies, is to belittle and nag him about the things that he hasn't gotten right yet. It is not going to fix him, and it is going to drive him away. And the Bible actually has a lot to say about this, and I want you to remember when we're reading these, these are God's words, these aren't my words. Look at uh, Proverbs 21, 19. It says, it's better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and nagging wife. That's pretty harsh. Better to be, go without water and be really hot than live with a nagging wife. And then Proverbs 25, 24 says, better to live on the corner of a roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Guys, don't look at your wife during this part. Don't smile. If you've already done it, you've already messed up here on this first day, look right at me. I get to preach to her on this. You don't. Does that make sense? But ladies, this is so important. One, the one that I think is the funniest of all the different scriptures about this is Proverbs 27, 15 that says that living with a quarrelsome and nagging wife is like being in a house with dripping water when it's raining. Drip, drip, drip. That's the description. And maybe a more modern description is it's better to watch a 1,000 episodes of The Bachelor than live with a nagging wife. Make sure that you're encouraging him, not belittling him. Another way to show respect to your husband is to put him first. After God, your husband should be the most important thing in your life. So God, your husband, then your kids, and everything else behind that. And I think so often we tend to put work ahead or our family or friends or all these different things. And when you put other things ahead of your husband, it shows him that he's not important and it shows a lack of respect to him. And moms, when you have kids, this becomes really difficult. And I get it because moms have this incredible love for their kids. And God put it there. It's healthy and good. You should be passionate about your kids. You should love them, but you shouldn't put them before your husband. Verse 31 says this, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two, the husband and wife, will become one flesh. Not the mom and her kids, but the husband and wife. And ladies, for those of you that think you're doing your kids a favor by putting them before your husband, you're actually not. What your kids need most is a home that's stable and secure. And you putting your husband first will give them that home. That will help make that happen for them. You're also showing them what a healthy marriage looks like one day when they start looking for a spouse. You're modeling for them what it looks like. So here are some practical ways that you can put your husband first in your household. The first is to spend time just with your husband, even when the kids are there. So when our kids were still at home, Lil and I would spend time together every night. We'd spend some time playing and talking to the kids, but eventually we'd uh, snuggle up on the couch or snuggle up somewhere else, and the kids saw us loving one another. They saw that we loved to be together. We were modeling for them what a healthy marriage looked like, and it showed the kids that Lil put me first, that that time was important to her. And some of you guys have young kids, and you're like, we can't really do that. I get it, but find time after your kids go to bed to spend time and make sure that your husband understands that he's a priority. Have regular date nights. Plan a night out with your husband and just constantly remind him leading up to that how excited you are to spend time with just him without any other distractions. Here's another area where you can show respect to your husband by putting him first in the house. Make sure you support your husband and his decisions 
over your kids. When you regularly side with your kids or you regularly disagree with your husband about parenting in front of the kids, it disrespects him and it doesn't put him first. I'm going to be transparent here. I have made a lot of bad decisions as a parent, especially I have three daughters. And I would say something that I thought was wise, helpful, funny, and one of my girls would bust into tears and go running from the room. I have no idea what just happened. My wife would calmly just continue to sit there. And later, when we were all alone, she would lovingly and gently explain why I'm an idiot and why what I said was wrong. But she didn't do that in front of the kids. Ladies, if you disagree with his parenting decision, unless he's putting the kids in danger, wait till later. Talk to him later about how he could have thought about that different. Don't do that in front of the kids because it shows disrespect to him. The same thing's true when your parents try to involve themselves in your marriage and they start criticizing your husband. You need to stand up to your own parents or your own family about your husband. You need to support him even when he's not easy to support. Verse 31 could not be more clear on this issue. Look at what it says. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. We leave our fathers and mothers. We start this new team. And priority one has to be the new team. Priority God, spouse, kids, everybody else. And you've got to do that. You cannot allow your parents to drive a wedge between you and your husband. Ladies and guys, Respect and honor your parents. Take care of your parents. Love your parents. We're called to do that. But we are also called to defend our spouse above everything else except God. The last practical idea for how a wife can show respect to her husband is to respond sexually. Now, ladies, I'm about to tell you something where men and women are different. It's going to catch you off guard. You're not going to, it's going to come as a surprise, but so don't be shocked when I tell you. Your husband may be more concerned about the frequency of sex than you are. I know, it's shocking. can't believe you heard it, but it's true. And the reality is that respecting your husband means sometimes responding sexually, even when you're not really in the mood. Look at those times as opportunities to be close to him, to find intimacy and connection to him. The Bible talks directly about this. Look at 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 5. It says, The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. Now for the naive here, Paul's talking about sex. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control talking directly here about mutual submission in the bedroom. What this is saying is when we get married, when we become one flesh, that the husband no longer has control over his own body, but he submits that to his wife. The wife no longer has control over her own body, but submits that to her husband. And so what that's telling us is to find mutual agreement on what it looks like to have physical intimacy. And so, ladies, I want to make sure, just make sure your husband is not frustrated with that aspect of your relationship and you find compromise. And, ladies, I know at points you feel unattractive. I know my wife does where she just can't imagine that I find her beautiful in those moments because she does not find herself very beautiful. And I know ladies have those moments. But he does find you attractive. He's just happy you're showing up. He's glad you're there. He finds you beautiful and sexy even when you don't. So don't withhold sexual intimacy for extended periods of time. And ladies, don't ever use sexual intimacy to try to control your husband or to punish your husband. Sexual intimacy is not a tool to control your husband. It is this beautiful gift from God that's to help make us one flesh, to bring us satisfaction and joy. Submit to one another Because you love Jesus. Looks different. Men and women are different. And the Bible is clear. So is John Gray in the 90s. We're different. But if we start to submit one to another with mutual respect and love, we'll start to see our marriages become these big, beautiful oceans that we hoped they would be. Don't don't settle for the pool. Don't settle for just okay. Don't settle for just a working relationship. Work towards a deeper commitment that brings joy and happiness in your marriage and brings honor and glory to God. I know it may surprise some of you guys, but I'm just going to own this. I, I'm not a good dancer. 
I'm not. And I know what you're thinking, and it's not because I'm overweight. That's not the reason I'm not a good dancer. I've never been a good dancer. When my wife and I got married, I was in great shape, and I was skinny. I was still a horrible dancer because I have no rhythm. And if you don't believe me, I cannot sing and clap at the same time. If you don't watch me in church, if I start to clap, I might sing and clap for just a minute, but I'll stop clapping because I can't sing while I clap. And so that lack of ability of any rhythm has made me a horrible dancer. And when Lil and I first got married, we were way more cultured than we are now. And so we'd go to these, these galas and these ball things for charities, and there'd be these big dance events. And I would get out on the dance floor with my wife and be so embarrassing. It would be horrible. I embarrassed me. I embarrassed my wife. She would try to help by leading, which made it even worse. And it was just, it was really not good. In fact, check out this video of me dancing to see just how bad it really is. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. What do you think, I'm stupid? I'm not going to show you guys a video of me dancing. I want you laughing with me, not, not at me. <laughs> but I, suffice it to say that I am a really bad dancer. But over the years, I've learned that mutual submission in marriage is really this beautiful dance. It, it, it's this dance where the husband is called to lead in spiritual matters. But when he does it well, the wife is going to gladly follow over time, when it works, this mutual submission becomes a dance that becomes second nature to us. And it's the goal. It's where we're headed. My wife and I, we've been dancing now for almost 35 years. It, it hadn't always been easy. We've danced through lots of different seasons. We've danced through the season of being newlyweds, which was awesome and amazing. And then we danced through the, the exciting but tiring time of having small children. We continued to dance as we went through the frustrating period of trying to teach teenagers what it looks like to be adults. And now we're entering a new part of the dance where it's this bittersweet part where we're home alone and watching our kids start families of themselves. But here's the thing. I'm so thankful that Lil will be my dance partner until the music of this life finally ends. That's the goal. It's this beautiful dance of relationship. Sometimes the dance is easy. Sometimes it's hard. It's a dance through joy and pain. It's through a dance through sickness and health, through wins and losses, through laughing and crying. But if it's done right, it's a beautiful thing to watch. And it's even more beautiful to be a part of. And so as we wrap up this sermon today, here's my encouragement to you. Love each other deeply and keep on dancing. Let's pray.